All right, welcome to part two of the multiple sclerosis lectures, white spots and red flags. In this lecture, we're going to focus on the mimics and variants of demyelinating disease and the red flags to watch out for to stay out of trouble. So again, the overall goal of these two lectures is to decrease the uh, misdiagnosis of MS on MRI. Uh, MS is a clinical diagnosis, not an MRI diagnosis. And in part two, we're going to now review the clinical and imaging red flags you should watch out for and go over the mimics of MS and other demyelinating disease variants. Another quote I like, not just the radiologist's fault, nothing shuts off critical neurological thought process faster than a diagnosis of multiple sclerosis. So when you're reading these studies, really look for or ask your referrers to clearly state clinically definite MS or not in the history. Uh, that'll help you out and keep you out of trouble when dealing with these variants and mimics of multiple sclerosis. All right, so clinical red flags to think of a better explanation for white matter spots than multiple sclerosis. Well, if the patient's the wrong age, outside the uh, 20 to 50 year old window, if they have a prominent family history of quote, multiple sclerosis, if there's abrupt swift progression of symptoms without recovery, is another one to watch out for. If the patient has systemic symptoms, fever, weight loss, skin, arthritis, skin rashes rather, peripheral neuropathy, and if there's any non-multiple sclerosis CNS symptoms like cognitive deficits early on in the disease, aphasia, um, seizures, hearing loss, or meningitis signs. The expert clinician's MS MRI checklist. So common locations uh, that you want to look for or common lesion types you want to look for. We kind of talked about this before in the part one lecture. The middle cerebellar peduncles, really any of the cerebellar peduncles, the MLF, nerve root entry in the brainstem, uh, usually trigeminal nerve root entry zone in the pons is a good one. Uh, the inferior anterior temporal horn white matter we talked about, Dawson fingers everybody knows about, corpus callosum, colossal septal interface, juxtacortical uh, lesions we talked about, the cortical lesions which are new for the revised criteria we talked about, and then the short segment spam uh, peripheral cord lesions. Things you want to watch out for um, on the MRI, if there are strokes, if there's bleeds, cysts, if your white matter lesions are too symmetric, too subcortical, or too normal looking. You don't want to have any of those. You want your check boxes to be more on the left than on the right side of this slide. All right, so let's get into the mimics of MS. Some of these are pretty common. Some of these are zebras. Migraines, common. Paroxysmal attacks of unilateral throbbing headache and autonomic system dysfunction. There's no definitive test. Women usually more than men. But we, ha we have to remember is that migraine is the etiology for white matter spots and MRI is about 7.5% of the U.S. population, where MS only affects 0.1% of the U.S. population. So it's more common for in, in daily practice when you're reading MRIs that chances are you're going to have migraine white matter spots that, rather than MS white matter spots. Okay. And in this nice study from 2013, it was a blinded study, 51% of their headache patients had flare bright lesions. So about 25% of them met the old uh, McDonald criteria. And what red flags here you want to see you know, when you're reading this, what you want to look out for, these, these white matter lesions are too symmetrical and too subcortical, okay? They're not very specific for MS or demyelinating disease for that matter. Another thing that we commonly see are chronic small vessel ischemic changes in the white matter, and risk factors for that would be increasing age, hypertension, diabetes, smoking, all the classic ones, um, genetics. And again, just like the headache white matter lesions, which are more common than MS in the general population. 3% of 40 year olds have white matter hyperintensities. And again, MS only affects 0.1% of the US population. So in any given day when you're reading studies, you're more likely to see chronic small vessel ischemic changes rather than MS white matter lesions. All right, let's get into uh, some more mimics. And a lot of these mimics are vascular related mimics. So the first one here is CNS vasculitis. And this patient was presenting with fever, night sweats, TIAs, and had also a history of CNS lupus. These white matter spots can mimic MS. Vasculitis is an inflammation of blood vessel walls. It can be primary or secondary. And you want to look in the history for TIAs and thunderclap headache. The red flags here would be uh, systemic clinical signs, fever, night sweats, lesions of the deep gray matter, and infarctions. And then also on the angio, you'll see the vessel wall narrowing. Another vasculitis is a, is a more of a zebra or rare vasculitis is Bisset disease. It's a chronic inflammatory vasculitis. Usually young males are more affected and it's prevalent in the Mediterranean region or people from Mediterranean region descent. And the clinical triad that we're, you know, taught in med school is oral ulcerations, general ulcerations, and ocular manifestations. 
And usually these cases can be flare bright lesions in the posterior fossa and basal ganglia with patchy enhancement as opposed to MS, which would be the peripheral incomplete enhancement. And the red flags here would be, you know, clinically skin and arthritic symptoms and lesions in the deep gray matter, which you usually don't see with multiple sclerosis. Another thing to look out for this disease is uh, these patients can have meningoencephalitis and cerebral vein thrombosis. So keep an eye out for those when you're reading these studies. And these people are usually treated with immunosuppression therapy. Uh, Sussac syndrome is another mimic of multiple sclerosis, but another vasculitis type disease. It's actually an autoimmune, autoimmune microangiopathy, more common in females, 20 to 40 years old. So it kind of overlaps the same demographic as MS, but it's usually monophasic over a long period of time, two to four years. And then the clinical triad here would be subacute encephalopathy, sensor neural hearing loss, and branch retinal artery occlusion. So these people usually have hearing and vision loss, which you usually, you know, don't really see uh, with multiple sclerosis patients, aside, you know, unless they have like optic neuritis with the vision loss, but um, this is a different type of vision loss. And also the SUSAC syndrome patients have central callosal lesions, which are kind of like in the mid portion of the corpus callosum rather than MS, which would be at the callosal septal interface, more inferiorly in the corpus callosum. Again, here's another example of case of a SUSAC syndrome with the uh, mid callosal lesion here, the central mid callosal rather than callosal septal location. And again, you could see the, the flare bright spots, some in the white matter, some periventricular. Uh, clinical red flags would here would be the subacute cognitive deficits early on in the disease, which usually doesn't happen until later in multiple sclerosis, and again, the hearing loss that you'll see with this microangiopathy. Another thing about SUSAC syndrome, you can have leptomeningeal enhancement from the microinfarctions of the cortex, and it can be seen up, in the, up to 50% of the cases, according to one paper, and they think that could be a predictor of relapses in future brain atrophy. Again, you can see leptomeningeal enhancement in multiple sclerosis if you really look for it, but usually those are patients that have a known diagnosis of MS. So if this is like an initial workup and you see leptomeningeal enhancement with white matter lesions, you know, think of other things that might be possible other than demyelinating disease. And one of them could be SUSAC syndrome. All right. Catacil is another mimic, another, another one of our vascular mimics. It's a cerebral autosomal dominant inherited arteriopathy or uh, with subcortical infarcts and leukoencephalopathy on chromosome 19 and stroke and TIAs in young adults with migraines. And the classic locations for this disease is the anterior temporal lobes, the external capsules, and the paramedian superior frontal lobes. Uh, red flags here would be obviously the family history. You, you know, MS shouldn't have a family history. This catacyl is autosomal dominant. Infarctions, which you don't see with multiple sclerosis, and usually these cases are very symmetric. You can see the three classic locations of the temporal poles, external capsules, and the Parame and superior frontal lobes are pretty symmetric here. Uh, Neurosweet syndrome, this is another uh, zebra type case of MS mimic. Uh, it's a rare inflammatory entity. Uh, it's a recurrent aseptic uh, encephalitis and also a febrile neutrophilic dermatosis. So the people get, um, these patients get painful papules. It can be secondary and perineoplastic. So keep that in mind and it's steroid responsive. Uh, the red flags here, again, would be skin symptoms, systemic signs, and deep gray and thalamic lesions, as in this case. Neuroline disease, pretty rare to see this with imaging findings on MRI. You know, one of the clues here would be cranial and spinal nerve enhancement. Again, this is a spirochete disease from Borrelia, but, you know, you can have periventricular and deep white matter lesions. But again, there's red flags of the uh, classic skin rash, arthritis, and the, the lesions on flare are usually very subcortical or periventricular. And there's not really infratentorial lesions or cortical juxtacortical lesions that you would see with MS. And again, the cranial nerve, like here in the central image on ocular motor nerve and the spinal nerve enhancement also should make you think of uh, some other entity besides MS. All right, so let's get into variants of demyelinating disease, other things that are classified as demyelinating disease other than multiple sclerosis. First one is ADEM, autoimmune-mediated demyelination, usually days to weeks after an infection or vaccination, and it's usually self-limited. It can, it can occur at any age with a male predominance, and you can see lesions in the brain or the spinal cord. And in this case, this was a 30-year-old with ataxia and cerebellar signs one week after a viral illness. 
And you can see this was self-limited because on the six month follow-up, the posterior fossa and the supratentorial lesions have for the most part resolved. Marburg disease, this is a clinically fulminant variant of demyelinating disease, usually in younger patients with a febrile prodrome. And again, you can see um, there's widespread demyelination, but again, some of the lesions have the incomplete ring of enhancement. So that is the tip off. This is a demyelinating process, not something infectious or metastatic. Baloconcentric sclerosis is another rare and severe variant of demyelinating disease, usually monophasic, and the lesions can be large. This one's not so large, but they have alternating zones of demyelination and remyelination, kind of like a target. Tumor fact of demyelinating lesions, we saw one of these cases in the first talk. People call these PDLs. They can usually be large, greater than two centimeters, but they're often solitary. Uh, the rim may restrict diffusion with the incomplete peripheral enhancement along the leading edge of the demyelination. You can see normal veins running through the lesion, and they usually have little to no mass effect for the size of the lesion. Okay, and then the other thing, if you are thinking maybe this could be a tumor, get perfusion imaging. And like this other case of a TDL, the DSC perfusion shows actually no uh, increase in the cerebral blood volume. Uh, moving along, uh, neuromyelitis optica spectrum, NMO used to be called the VIX disease. It's from autoantibody to aquaporin-4 water channel. So a lot of these lesions you'll see next to, or in structures next to CSF. When these patients get optic neuritis, it's usually post-chiasmatic and bilateral, as opposed to MS, which is usually unilateral and anterior to the chiasm. They usually get a longitudinally extensive myelitis rather than the short segment MS lesions. It's treated with corticosteroids and rituximab. The thing is, with NMO, you need to treat as soon as possible to reduce core morbidities, because this is, some people think, a more severe disease than multiple sclerosis. But the problem is, if you misdiagnose this as multiple sclerosis, those multiple sclerosis disease-modifying therapies like beta interferon can exacerbate NMO and actually make it worse. So it's important that you understand the differentiating imaging features between the two diseases that we'll get into now. And then in this case, this is the post-chiasmatic optic tract neuritis. So NMO, they can have non-specific white matter hyperintensities, uh, not uncommon. When you look at the callosum, the lesions are wide and thin of the ependymal lining of the ventricle here, as opposed to focal lesions in MS where you get at the colossal septal interface. And here's the case of enhancement along the ependymal lining. And here's another case of chiasmatic or post-chiasmatic bilateral optic pathway neuritis suggests more NMO rather than MS. Uh, differential for colossal lesion by location. Here's another case of SUSAC where you have the focal central colossal lesions. NMO, we have the wide, long, and thin ependymal lesions and then multiple sclerosis where they're focal and along the colossal septal interface. Uh, suggestive MRI findings of NMO, diencephalic lesions, dorsal brainstem, the wide arch bridge callosal lesions we just talked about, the nonspecific wide periventricular hazy lesions, which we showed. Large lesions following the white matter tracts, like the cortical spinal tract, is pretty specific. Bilateral or post-chiasmatic optic pathway lesions. And on this image on the right, you can see the longitudinally extensive central cord lesion. Again, the central cord because the aquaporin around the uh, central canal, as opposed to the peripheral cord with MS. Um, so MRI features to distinguish NMO from MS. So with NMO, again, the spinal cord is expansile, usually bigger than three segments. The central gray matter is involved. The optic nerve is usually extensive bilateral post-chiasmatic. These wide, hazy, periependymal, periventricular lesions with NMO, as opposed to focal classic Dawson fingers with MS. And then the enhancement pattern, it's usually cloud-like or ependymal. And then in MS, we've seen the peripheral ovoid ring-like enhancing lesions. All right, moving along to uh, PML. So the first type of PML is the AIDS-related PML. With It's an opportunistic infection by the DNA JC virus, and it causes demyelination. There's usually involvement of the uh, subcortical U fibers with little to no enhancement or mass effect given the size of the lesion. You can actually see volume loss like in the left frontal lobe in this case, the lesions can be solitary or multifocal and without treatment, the patient will die within months. The other type of PML that we're more concerned with for this, for the purposes of this talk would be MS treatment related PML. Usually the classic is MS patient onto Sabre. You know, these monoclonal antibodies prevent lymphocytes from crossing the blood brain barrier. It does a really good job at reducing MS relapses, but unfortunately it increases the risk for PML. So in this patient that I had from fellowship, it was a definite MS patient, and we can see going along in time, no symptoms on this follow-up 2013 scan, stable MS, no symptoms, again, stable MS, but maybe these lesions are kind of getting more confluent. 2014, 
Now the patient has right lower extremity weakness, because remember, this is on the left side of the brain. Uh-oh, these lesions are more apparent now. And then, you know, 2014, it's a widespread confluent PML lesion. And then the patient, unfortunately, has passed. But if you went back to 2013, you can see how this lesion was being more progressive in the uh, subcortical white matter here, juxtacortical white matter. And one of the things that, you know, we noticed and now is in the literature is that you can get focal SWI, susceptibility weighted imaging change early in asymptomatic to sabri related PML. So if you go back and look at your MS cases, you, you, you can look at SWI and see there's a new susceptibility artifact in the uh, heart good fibers. It's so sensitive, but not specific because the thing you have to understand is that the SWI signal changes can be seen in old MS plaques, but when you have rapid development of SWI signal changes in a new MS lesion on somebody on Tasabre or other immunotherapy, you have to really worry about developing PML in an MS patient. So yes, you can see PML or you can see SWI signal changes in chronic MS plaques, but it's that rapid development, that rapid demyelination that causes the SWI changes from PML, okay, that you want to watch out for. All right, so MRI signs of PML for a new lesion in an asymptomatic MS patient on Tasabre. You want to look for the, the punctate T2 lesions in a satellite or perivascular distribution, that Milky Way sign that I'll show next. The lesion involves the cortex. It has ill-defined hazy borders towards the white matter, and if there's like the, uh, the contrast enhancement. Those are all good signs that you might be dealing with PML in an MS Tasabre or immunotherapy-treated patient. And again, here's, here's what the Milky Way sign looks like on a on a T2 image looks just like the galaxy, the Milky Way. So take home points, read the chart for clinical red flags. When you're reading the MRI, look for these red flags, strokes, bleed, cysts. Are the lesions too symmetric, too subcortical, or too normal looking? Those white matter lesions. Uh, the white matter lesions on MRI due to migraines and microvasculars, chronic small vessel ischemic disease are much more common than multiple sclerosis. Keep that in mind. NMO has differentiating features than MS, and we want to realize those so we don't put NMO patients on MS disease-modifying therapies that can exacerbate their symptoms. And remember to search for uh, treatment-related PML on SWI images. Maybe include that into your protocols. It's that rapid development of the SWI new signal change in uh, a patient with MS treatment that should raise, raise the red flag that this maybe is PML. Okay? So, uh, again, thanks for listening and tuning in. Thanks for the uh, contributors here, and we'll see you next time.